You, you have this. So with that, here's Mrs. Cherry, and she's going to do the formal introduction of our guest for today. Thank you, Dr. Anderson. My name is Mrs. Cherry, and I'm the alumni director here at Homewood Flossmore High School. Um, and what does that mean? That means that I work with 40,000 graduates of this high school. So we develop programs and activities um, for our alumni. And one of the main things we do is we try to bring alumni back to school so that you have a chance to see who they were and what they've become. And the same thing can happen to you if you really um, apply yourself here at HF. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, Dr. Adigan. Um, she was a transfer student here to HF. She came from Evanston High School. But she immediately made her mark. She uh, ended up as the captain of the girls' basketball team. And then she was a bona fide track star. Um, she propelled a team that finished second in state in 2005. When she left HF, she went off to the University of Houston, where she um, was also a track star. And um, she was actually the um, NCAA bronze medalist. Um, and she was a hurdler, and she ran the 4x100. Um, when her track career was over at the collegiate level, she turned to... Um, determining whether she could be an Olympian. Um, and through lots of hard work, dedication, and perseverance, um, she made the Nigerian uh, women's track team for the 2012 London Olympics where she competed. But then an amazing thing happened. She stopped by our office a few years after that, and she came in and she said, you know, I think I'm going to try the bobsled. And we were like, what? The bobsled? That's crazy. We don't even know what that is, and it sounds so dangerous. She's like, I'm going to try it. So she uh, worked with the USA bobsled team, and while she was doing that, she's like, hey, Nigeria has never been represented in the Winter Olympics. I'm going to change that. Um, so she crowdsourced her way to pay for that team and to pay for her sled, um, and she went through all of the trials, her and her teammates, and... They went to the 2018 Olympics in South Korea. So that was a first. Um, she was an amazing student athlete, and that is what is important to remember. When she left HF, she was a National Honor Society member. She went off and she got uh, a bachelor's degree, two master's degrees, and she worked on her doctorate um, while she was um, trying out for the Nigerian team. So she is very, very accomplished. We've got a little video here we're going to show of her. Then we're going to let her have a chance to tell her story. We'll do some Q&A. And then she's got a couple little quizzes for us afterwards. So you got to pay attention. It, it gets it gets good. Don't worry, we'll get we'll get you guys some visual stuff going on. But I am so happy to be here. I'm so happy to be back at HF. Man, can I just get a round of applause for all of y'all? I don't want to bore y'all to, to tears. You know, we're here, we hanging out, we are family, we cousins and stuff, right? Because we all love each other. So like, we just cousins and everything. So this is a family thing. So um, as we continue going forward, I'm obviously going to tell you guys a little bit more of an intimate side of the story because obviously what you guys see on TV or what you see on these, um, these reports and stuff like that is just part of the story. You know, I wanted to really resonate with you guys because I was sitting in the same exact seats. Literally, um, you know, I'm class of 05, so I graduated from HF out of here. And um, I want you guys to just be able to see, like, have visual representation of what it actually means to come out of this program, to come out of this area, and then to be able to aspire to do things and get them done. So I'm going to share with you guys some of the details, the nitty gritty of the story, and everything you want to know. And I'm going to give you guys the opportunity to ask some questions, okay, afterwards. In, in between, afterwards. We're going to have some fun, all right? Y'all cool with that? Can we do, can we do that? Yeah, yeah, kind of, yeah. Come on, yeah. All right, yeah. okay. So, um, I want to start first by letting you guys know something special, right? I quit track and field here. I quit track and field in college. 
I didn't think I was going to be a bobsled athlete. I transferred here in the middle of my junior year, which for all of my athletes, where are my athletes at? How many people in here are athletes? All right, all right. And you, and you don't have to be like on a team here, but if you know, you can go to the gym and you go know, like do a little something by yourself. That's, I, you're an athlete to me. I, I'll take that. So I transferred here in the middle of my junior year. And for those of you who understand how detrimental it is to move in the middle of your junior year, all the way from one side of the city to the other side, you know, recruiting is rough. So I went, I was a walk-on at University of Houston. I did not get a scholarship until I got to University of Houston. And here I am standing before you as a two-time Olympian, the first only to compete from the continent of Africa in the summer and winter Olympic Games. And that's in the world. So, um, and I say all these things to say this. When I came here to HF, I was like six, 17, 16 years old, and I did not really want to make any friends. Like, I was like, I mean, I'm only gonna be here for like a year, so what's the point of getting close to people? But when I came here, I was accepted in what became a new family. And it was great that I had the opportunity to do sports because obviously you create a whole new world of opportunity in that. But realistically, what I got was lifelong friendships, was commitment, were tools that I took to the rest of the world. So not only was I able to athletically excel, a lot of what I got from this very, very building and this academia right here led me to getting two bachelor's, two master's, and a doctor's degree. Um, Thank you. So I want you guys to know this. When I started, I was, like I said, I was unrecruited coming from here going to the University of Houston because I was a late bloomer. So if you're a late bloomer out there, it's okay. Just take your time, be consistent, be persistent, and things will start to fall in place for you. But what I did and what I do to this day is I set a goal. I set a goal in my head. I said, this is what I want to do. I want to compete a Division I track and field. And I said that was the goal, and it was like, well, what do I have to do to get there? What are the steps I need to take to actually get to that goal? And then I figured out those steps. I need to do this, I need to do that, I need to do this. I reached out to the schools that I wanted to go to, I got emails back, and I worked my butt off. And through working, what I ended up doing was tossing away the goal, because the goal was to, to just play, to just make a team. But what I ended up doing was executing so well that I earned a scholarship to go to this team. And that's what it's about. Y'all can't focus so far ahead on the end goal that you forget the pieces that it takes to get there. Because what happens is when you actually execute, the end goal is going to come back because you started the plan with the end goal in the first place. But it'll surface itself even better than it was when you first thought it up. Because now you're executing a plan. You've got to have a plan. Balancing life, with whether it's academics and athletics, whether it's working in academics, whatever it is, is about time management. But we get so caught up in where we're trying to go that we forget the steps we need to take to get there. I need all of you guys to take the steps to get there, because that's exactly what I had to do to get the things that I did, coming from the exact same places that you guys came from. So now let's get fun. Let me tell you about the inside. I'm going to get inside stuff. So I went to, oh, I had the blessing of being on the Ellen DeGeneres show. I got to hang out with Ellen. She was pretty dope. She was really cool, actually. Um, we had an E60. So all you ESPN fans, if y'all want to go out there and watch the E60, we, got, we had some really cool accolades that came with being the first African bobsled team. But I never thought I would start a bobsled team. First of all, why? Like, <laughs> what am I doing on ice? Second of all, I moved to Houston, Texas. There is absolutely no snow there. But this is how it came about. My senior year in college, I had my second heart surgery. Ooh, there's a spin on this story. Yes, second heart surgery. I would go to practice every single day thinking that I was going to die, every day. Imagine going to practice what you love, you love sports, or you love whatever you do, but somebody jumps you every day, or beats you up, boom, 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 knocks you out. 
And he's like, all right, I'll come back tomorrow. I'll get another beat up. Okay, I'm coming. It's madness, right? So emotionally, mentally, physically, I was drained. I was done. I quit. I was like, I can't do this. I quit. Can I lose your track twice? I said, I'm not coming back to this stuff. It's, it's madness. But something just kept pulling me back and pulling me back into it. And after that second heart surgery, all of a sudden, I started breaking world times, breaking records. I was ranked number 14 in the world as a senior in high school. And I was like, wait a minute, wait, wait a minute. <laughs> My coach looked at me and said, Sean, I think you've been robbed three years. I think we haven't had the opportunity to really do this. I think you can do this Olympic thing. But in my head, I had already gotten into grad school in Tennessee because I was moving on from athletics. I was like, this is just my last year. I'm just going to finish this out, coach. He's like, I think you should give it another chance. But like I told y'all, imagine for years and years and years and years, just feeling like you're getting beat up every single day. I was emotionally taxed. But something regenerated in my soul, and I decided to stick with it. So in 2012, I, after being a three-time Nigerian champion and a two-time African champion in the 100 hurdles, I qualified for the 2012 Summer Olympics with a broken leg. I had a stress fracture, y'all. Can you imagine all this hard work and all this madness if my leg had the nerve to break before the game? <laughs> do y'all know what type of craziness that is? I said, you know what, I'm gonna do this. My doctor said, Sean, you're a hurdler, so you know if you keep running, your leg will snap in half. I said, well, guess what? We're just gonna have to crack that thing, because I'm gonna keep running. <laughs> Me and God had a conversation, he said, Sean, just keep running, I got your back, and I'm gonna do that. <laughs> <laughs> execution to the final goal. I'm telling you, these are all a part of the steps. I'm, I'm trying to get y'all some. I hope y'all take it. So I decided to keep going. I made it to the Olympic Games off a whim. It was the worst race of my life. It was completely devastating that I had set out for, at least at that point, the last seven years to make it to the Olympic Games and I get there in the best shape of my life with a, with a broken leg and I suck. So you think to yourself like, oh, okay, well, at least you went to the Olympics, you know, but that wasn't enough for me. And as an African champion, you would think I would resign or I would say, you know what, hey, I'm retiring. But I knew August 6, 2012, after my race, I was retiring. Like, I was literally, like, nobody could tell me, Sean, you should come. No, no, we're not doing it. Okay? So I decided to retire, but I never announced it. And I was like, well, why didn't I announce it? Like, over the years. So I coached five years at NCAA at University of Houston. Let me tell you how God works in my life, right? I was an athlete that graduated in June of 2009, and by September, I was coaching at the same university that I graduated from, and getting my master's at the same time, and training for an Olympic Games at the same time. So in my mind, I'm like, I got three full-time jobs all the same time. Lord, I asked for a blessing, but not all at once. But we're gonna work it out. We're gonna figure it out together. We're gonna do it together. And so I continued to coach after I was done in 2012. Just focused on coaching, but I said, man, I feel like there's something more I can give to my athletes. I know I'm the youngest coach in D1 that's got all American athletes, but that's fine. I, I know I can make better athletes. I'm gonna be great. I'm gonna be great at everything I do. What you want me to do? I'm gonna be great at it. Because that's what it is. Why do something and not be great? I'm gonna be great. So I said, I need to go back to school. I need to go back to school again. Like I know I have a bachelor's and a master's, that's cool, that's great, but I need to go back in order to give people what I really want to give them, to really live in my purpose. Don't forget the word purpose, because it's really important in your life. So I decided to resign from coaching, my favorite job, everything there was perfect, just to go back to school. And I got there with a dual, I enrolled in a dual degree program. So I was a doctor of chiropractic and another master's of science in health and human performance. Because I'm actually a biomechanist, I do biomechanics, kinematics. So all you people that are talking about kinesiology and things like that, that's the type of stuff that I go from there, exercise science. So I started this program, and y'all, this is the first time in my whole life I wasn't an athlete. So you know I'm dragging. I'm like, Lord, I'm going to school. My attention span isn't that great. I need to run or something, lift the weight, do something. So I decided to cheer for my friends in the 2014 Olympic Games, only to, to decide, like, hmm, this sport of bobsled that they're doing, I think I could do this. I think I could do it. So I sat on it for like eight months. I didn't do it. 
I just sat on it. I was like, all right, Sean, you're kind of crazy. You just started a whole medical program. You dropped your life to do that. Why would you try to pick up something else? But eight months later, I just happened to Google, and I saw that there was a combine for the U.S. bobsled team happening three hours from me in Dallas. And I was like, Lord, I know we talked about this, so if I'm messing around and make this team, I haven't trained in three years, then maybe I need to do the sport. So for six weeks, I went to the gym. I started going hard. I was like, I gotta get myself as ready as I could possibly get. Do y'all wanna believe I messed around and made this U.S. team? I was like, oh. I made the team, and I said, okay, all right, Sean, we're in this dual degree, and now we're doing bobsled. Okay, people drop their lives to do either or, and here you are thinking it's a good idea to do both. All right, we need a, a plan. And that's when I got back to, I remember this plan, this goal, and the steps along the way of execution. So while I was there, while I was doing it, all of a sudden I started to hear and find out. And mind you, I was a World Cup brakeman on the U.S. team. So World Cup is the highest cup you can compete on outside of the Olympic Games. So I was one of the, you know, one of the better brakemen on the team. After I decided to be a brakeman on the U.S. team, I looked up and I was like, man, this idea of Nigeria just kept flying back in my head. And I said, okay, the sport's trying to grow. They need more women's teams, okay? I'm a woman, okay, we can do that. <laughs> they said, okay, Nigeria, because I was an Olympian before, I had a relationship with the Nigerian Olympic Committee, so they're like, well, you have a relationship with an African Olympic Committee, and Africa as a continent has never had a bobsled team ever. This 2016, you telling me nobody from Africa, that is one billion people Nobody has ever gotten in a bobsled or decided to, to try and do that and give that back to people who haven't been represented. I said, all right. So now all of a sudden my brain's running and running and running and running. Nigeria has never had a Winter Olympian, period. I said, okay, well, I'm in a unique position to help get this done, but how am I supposed to do that when I got to pass 26 credit hours this trimester? Okay, we're gonna figure this out. So eventually I figured it out. It took a while. I was nervous, I was stressed out, and then I decided I was gonna create the Nigerian Bobsled Team. I created the Nigerian Bobsled Team through GoFundMe. <laughs> That's crazy, right? I created it through, I didn't create it through GoFundMe, I launched the announcement through GoFundMe. See, I already been kind of working on it, but I had to get really calculated in how I did it. And so when the GoFundMe came around, I knew I needed funds. I needed about $150,000 to get to the Olympic Games. And there was no way I was gonna do that on my student income, and I was unemployed, obviously, because I quit my job. So I decided to launch the GoFundMe, not knowing that it was gonna go viral, and everybody was gonna be excited about this new found bobsled team. Next thing you know, we're raising funds, we're qualifying, and I have to qualify. I qualified after running five races on three separate tracks within two seasons for the Winter Olympic Games. <laughs> then in the midst of that, I was still in school. So I had to finish up, and mind you, the only reason why my school allowed me to continue to do this is because I told them that I was gonna hold myself accountable for every single ounce of it work that I needed to get done. Everything I needed to get done, it wasn't your responsibility as a teacher to know that I decided to start bobsled. I was gonna do my work by myself, and I was gonna do good at it. And that's what I did. I stayed, whether I was in Canada, or New York, or wherever I was, I would Skype into class, try and learn what it is, because being a doctor, obviously you have to care for people's well-being. And I wanted people to know that I was really going to be a great doctor. Like I said, if I'm gonna do it, I wanna be great at it. Why stop in the middle? So, so I got there by um, telling these teachers this. They allowed me to do that. So sometimes I would come back from bobsled land and I have like 15 exams to take in one week. You talk about no sleep? Oh yeah. You can call me no sleep salad because that's exactly what I was doing. None, zero sleep. So I, I just want, I tell you guys this story to, to give you an outlook on what it means to actually try and achieve greatness or try and be the best that you can be. 
There are so many times you can set a goal and say, I want to do this, I want to be here, I want to have this. But how do you get there? How do you really get there? What is it that you're actually doing to commit yourself to actually being as great as you want to be? People will look at these videos or look at, oh, you know, you having a good time with, with uh, Ellen or whoever, but they don't know the story, they don't know the buildup, they don't know how you get there. There's not gonna be most stories that are gonna be cookie cutter and clean. Most of them have a lot of things associated with them. And that's what I want you guys to understand. Life in itself is gonna throw you all kinds of angles. It is your job to be prepared. It is your job to see the bigger picture. It is your job to take control over what happens in your life. I, I want you guys to be able to see these things as a benefit for you. Because like I said, we're coming from the exact same place. So, that being said, I want to show you guys. Wait, before I show this video, how many of y'all actually know what bobsled is? All right. Yes, that's exactly what I thought. Oh, we got this one up. Okay. Okay. Okay, let's go with, um, okay, so all of that I just said to y'all is basically wrapped up in a little reel here in a nutshell. Okay, so um, this was actually going to bring me to my question of what bobsled really is. In a few minutes, I'm actually going to have 10 people up here because I'm, I'm going to ask you guys a couple questions. So get your, get your stuff ready, because I have a couple things I want to give out. And uh, I need to look, everybody like, please don't call me. Please. <laughs> All right, so bobsled. Bobsled is actually a women's sport where women have two, up to four, but men have two or four people in a sled. It is, you sliding down an ice mountain in a carbon fiber uh, instrument that's shaped like a sled that actually is about 380 pounds or so. So it's really heavy, it's a really heavy thing. You go about anywhere from 60 or 70 to 100 miles an hour. I had to learn to drive this thing. Now, all of you who have your driver's license, you know obviously to get a driver's license, that means that you know how to drive, you, you know how to operate a vehicle, but would you, how many of you guys actually have your driver's license right now? <laughs> of those of you, keep your hands up. Of those of you with your driver's license, how many of y'all think y'all can handle driving in that Daytona right now? Thank you. <laughs> like really, I, you better be great. You better shoot for the stars. All right. <laughs> That's exactly what it was like. It's like imagine getting your driver's license. And you, so you know how to operate a vehicle, but now you gotta drive with the fastest people on the planet. That's how it was driving the boss. So you can imagine, it was all survival mode the whole time, all the time I was there. So me needing to qualify was the actual obstacle. It wasn't even about like, let's get first, second, third, fourth. The accolades were already gonna come because we were putting the world on our back. Because we were putting a continent on our back because we were building opportunities for future generations to create in a space that they had never been in before. That's where our accolades were coming from. The realistic, competitive nature of us, though, was in trying to qualify. And so qualifying for the Olympic Games, at the Olympic Games themselves, I dropped seven seconds of my time. And for those of you who understand time dropping, that's a significant amount of time to drop in six, in six runs. And the only reason why I did that was because I was like, it's guts and glory by this time, y'all. We gonna have to either get it or get it. We, that's it, we only have no other option just to get it. So, for those of you who don't, who've never seen Bob said before, I want you to check out the Olympic race. <laughs> one of those days that you really can't just describe, you know, it's just full of all kinds of emotions.
we have represented to the best of our ability, and hopefully that inspired people to join in. So in this time right here, don't forget my people, I'm gonna get I'm gonna my 10 people up, but I really wanna give you guys the opportunity to ask some questions. Like I said, y'all, we family, right? We family, this is cousins, hey cousin, how you doing? We, um, oh hey cousin, hey. <laughs> so I want you guys to really, I'm here to give you my brain, my heart, my existence. I am somebody, again, that has been through probably most, if not all, of what many of you have been through. And I want you guys to really ask me, like, use me as a resource right now. Whatever you need to know, or if it's just something that you're curious about the journey, um, let me know. Like I said, I have experience, whether it is athletically or academically or just as a human being. So I want to open up the floor for some questions. Okay. I know, like, with what you said about, like, the nights that you spent without sleep or, like, anything like that, like, I know that takes a lot of self-motivation. Like, how did you do that? Wow. She asked... Sorry. Uh, she asked with um, the nights without sleep, how do I keep myself self-motivated? It goes back to the whole thing I was telling you guys about, about having a goal and then executing the goal along the way. Because sometimes the goal itself is so far that it can get overwhelming, right? And so you get stressed out. Whether it is a test that's coming, whether it is an athletic competition that's coming, the far goal gets stressful. But what you do is when you put together that plan to get there, you actually create pieces you can shoot. And so instead of allowing myself to get overwhelmed by the big picture, I would sit back and chew up the little pieces. So then not only am I getting somewhere along the plan, but I feel like I'm accomplishing something. And so it actually makes me feel better. Like, okay, well, I'm getting there. I'm getting better. Because you can celebrate the little victories that way. Okay. Hi, right here. Hey. Hey. <laughs> Like that's just like it's just a story. Like I don't even think it's real, but like you, like you did something for real, something like that serious. So like, did you meet them? Yes, <gasps> I did. Y'all wanna know? <laughs> that's how I felt, bro. That's how I felt for real. So cool running was actually real, right? And honestly, if it wasn't for the Jamaican bobsled team, I would not have been able to probably do things that I did in the way that I did. But at the Olympic Games, the original driver. And the original breakman was actually there, and I got to take a picture with them. And they know my story because we have the same ESPN uh, correspondent. And so when we got there, she was just like, or he was like, I, I told him who I was, and we embraced, and I thanked him, and I gave him the flowers while he could still smell them to let him know, like, it's because of people like you that help blaze trails for people like me, which is why I'm doing what I'm doing right now. And that makes the stress all worth it. Um, so when you're actually sledding your sled, how does it feel barreling down a tube of ice in just a carbon fiber container? So it feels like you're getting jumped <laughs> by like three people. It, it, it feels a little something like... <laughs> you are, you're going, I'm not even lying, like you're in there like... You, um, you hit every single wall. You're going so fast that gravity is literally sucking you to the bottom of the sled. They're called gravitational forces, G-forces. And so the brakemen are in there like this, except they're sitting down. And I'm the only one that's sitting, and I'm like this, in the sled. So 
I'm just, you're just getting thrown around. And because we were small, I had to put extra padding in my sled. Interestingly enough, I had to put weight in my sled at the Olympic Games because I was so small compared to everybody else that those forces, I wasn't generating enough acceleration. So it feels like you get beat up a little bit. It's like, put yourself in a trash can at the top of a, mount, a hill, a mountain, and then let somebody roll you down and step it. <laughs> now, now it all makes sense, like, do 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 do. Alright, um, so you've done a lot of really great, cool things. Thank you for sharing your story. It's very Thank inspiring. You. Thank you. Um, what are you doing now? Like, what's your next big thing? It's a great question. So right now, I'm actually doing three major things. So, I am still working with the Boston Skeleton Federation to help bring in the new class of athletes to go to 2022, which we actually now have a men's bobsled team for Nigeria. So, yeah, super excited about that growth. So, thank you. Working on trying to help bring up the next generation of athletes on one part. The second thing I'm doing is, as a practitioner, I'm a chiropractor, and I am also a biomechanist, so I specialize in injury prevention and rehabilitation. So I'm building an injury prevention and rehabilitation center in Houston that's going to be a high-level performance, high-level performance center. Um, and then the third thing I'm doing is things like this, like public speaking, and still kind of getting pulled in like a public figure manner. So uh, yeah, I'm just trying to share with as many people the things that are going on in my head and in my heart to empower them to be just as great as they can be. You guys are top. You too. Much. Yes. Do you make any money as an uh, Olympic athlete? That's a great question. That is a great question. As an Olympic athlete, you actually don't. Most Olympic athletes are not paid because Olympianism is an amateur sport. You can be an Olympic athlete and still go and play NCAA sports. Because the Olympics, the, orig the origin of the Olympics were because back in the days, you know like the people that did a lot of the gladiators and things like that, they were actually professional athletes. So then that left the people who weren't good enough to compete with them just like nowhere. And so they created a movement that allowed amateur athletes to be able to represent their country and to represent friendship and community and things like that. Almost all the Olympic doctors and everybody you see are mostly all volunteers. So Olympic athletes don't make money, but the way you make money as an Olympic athlete is you have sponsors that endorse you. And so your sponsors are the one that actually pay you. Most times the countries, depending on what country you compete for, may also give you like prize money if you get first, second, third, or something like that. But as an Olympic athlete, you actually do not make money. Most Olympic athletes are actually working nine to fives. Um. All right. So, um, doing what you did, you know, that was a crazy accomplishment. Wait, wait, wait. wait. Yeah. So, my, older, my younger brother after me, he actually is in entertainment. And my older brother, he is probably the only one out of us that's not in anything artistic. He works in Club in America. But we're all athletes of entertainment, you know, things like that. Yeah. And I'll probably take a couple more questions. And then I'm also going to have some time afterwards if y'all want to just kick it because we're cousins now, you know, so we can hang out. Uh, hello? Oh, it works. Hello. How far did it to get into Bob's How did you get into it? Well, it's actually not that difficult to get into the sport. Uh, the sport itself is open, it's just that there's not a lot of information about it. And so this whole movement actually helped bring out some of the information of the sport. But yeah, if you want to get on a bobsled team, uh, the U.S. has a bunch of combines that they do around the country, and all you have to do is try out a combine, and they let you through the process from there. Um, and if you're trying to get on a Nigerian bobsled team, anybody out here, you just go online and register there as well. We do combines. So that's how most teams happen. They just do combines, you try out, and then you join the team. And probably two more questions. Oh, there we are. All right, so um, in one of your videos, you was like doing your like, hand moves or something like that. You know, usually people would like, you know, do like that. Was that something? Yeah, 
No, that's actually really I just said a lot of that. No, that's a great question. I don't understand exactly where you that I got that. Alright. So um what what drivers do is we do something called visualization. And it's actually a practice that a lot of athletes do, and I, I actually encourage you if you're an athlete to do the same thing. We, we have to visualize where we're going before we get there because we're going so fast that by the time you see it, it's gone. And so you have to know every curve and every steer, but mind you, there's 14 to 22 curves. There's somewhere between two to three steers at each curve, and then you have to know where you are on the track. So you have to be able to go through the motions of where your curves are, where your turns are, before you even come there and you see it. You see it the whole way around. So every time we go, we do a track walk. And so we do like maybe 50 mile runs before we go so that we already know where the track is before we get to it. So what you see, it kind of looks like a dance. Like people used to make fun of me. They're like, are you dancing? Like, no, I'm trying to not to crash, okay? <laughs> so that's, that's what that is. But yeah, it's just a visualization. An interesting point about visualization that I said about athletes. So 2012, NSA Olympic year, indoor that year, I ran the fastest time of my life indoor, and I was bleeding internally, and I hadn't run in six days. The reason why I feel like I was able to get, which is also scientifically proven in a lot of cases as well now, is through visualization, because I physically was unable to hurdle because I had, I had a car wreck and the car accident had me bleeding internally that I didn't even know. And I was just like, dang, something hurts and I don't feel right. And so I just was like, I'm just gonna pull up to the ER and see what happens. And as soon as I pull up there, they're like, uh, ma'am, and they like rushed me inside because I had like blood pooling behind my liver. It was all bad. And so I was like, well, guess what? Uh, I have to go to Istanbul for six days, so how are we gonna work this out? And they said, well, you can go, we'll let you fly, but you cannot hurdle right now because all of your, like, you, the places that are bleeding are very fragile. So all I did was I visualized and visualized and visualized. And some of you, if you've ever done that before, you can even probably feel like your muscles will twitch. It's probably, I think about, they said like 50 to 70% of your neural response is the same as you actually physically doing it when you visualize. So if you're ever in a position where you can't get through something, or even in life, when you're trying to figure out how to get to the end goal, visualize yourself getting through every single step. It'll really start to make things make sense for you in real life. One more question. Okay, okay. so you kind of answered this with a visualization, but um, basically, like when you were going through the internal bleeding and the, and the heart surgery and a bunch of things that you just couldn't control, like how did you keep your faith and like how did you keep going forward with your positive attitude? Because like a lot of people would just feel like giving up. That's a really amazing question. So one thing I did was I got to know myself, which I also encourage all of you to do the same thing. Get to know yourself. Get to know yourself a little bit better. Get to know what works for you, what you like, what you don't like, how you move, and that's what I did. And I know one thing about me is I like to have a good time. I like to smile, I like to dance, I like to act a fool, I like to be me, I like to be encouraged. So in times where I was struggling, I would just go back to the things I knew that I enjoyed about myself. So I would just literally celebrate pain. I would literally um, just think about the fact that I really, really enjoyed dancing, so I would play a song that I knew would make me happy, and then I would live in that moment instead of living in the moment of, of sadness or the moment of stress or the moment of disappointment. And so you gotta get to know yourself, get to know the things that matter because then you can disregard the things that don't matter, the things that you don't have control over. Most times we spend all our time dwelling on the things we don't have control over when you can really just put your energy into something new. So, Dr. Adigan, we do have time because class does not get, this does not get out till 3 o'clock. Okay. So we have time some, for some more. Can I okay. ask you one quick question? Yeah, I know that you're recently involved. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. So one of the things that I'm doing as, as, uh, as a way to give back, again, into the world and sharing the, and the things that I've experienced is I recently became a global ambassador for the Special Olympics. And the Special Olympics, as many of you may or may not know, is actually um, an Olympic movement for people that have intellectual disabilities. And what it is, is it really is a push towards inclusion. And I'm all about inclusion, I'm all about innovation, I'm all about giving people the opportunity to be great. Because nobody thought that an African girl would be able to create something that would globally have representation. And so I believe in each and every one of you and every single person's ability 
to be inclusive and to share that with the rest of the world. And so now I'm, I'm doing some work with Special Olympics. I'll actually be going to the World Games in Abu Dhabi next month with them to where, where they're gonna compete. So I'm really excited about that. How you doing? How you doing? I'm good. I'm good. Alright, so uh, how do you get in the Olympics? Like, do you like sign up online? <laughs> like, do you like sign up online? Stand up in line. Stand up in the Olympics. Oh, sign up online. Yeah, no, you don't sign up online. But you know what? It would be, it, would, it depends on the sport. It depends on what you're trying to go to the Olympics for. Because everybody has different qualifying standards. Like for track and field, I had to run a specific time. And that time right there will get me selected by the country. Uh, U.S. has trials for most of the Olympic teams. So you'll see like the U.S. Olympic trials and the people that place top three now make the team. So it's different. Every sport has a different thing. But unfortunately, you can't sign up online. That's why it's only like one in every, I think, something million people that's actually an Olympian. No oh wait, are we on? Hello. 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 Okay, Amari? Jane? Christiana? Oh, it's not on. <laughs> oh, sorry. Okay, yeah. I drive Bob's list with his back. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Alright, I'm with you. Oh, I should have taken off. I'm Denim. Alright, Denim. Pedro. Okay, Pedro. Okay, the winner is Ben. 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 Alright, you guys. Oh, I guess I have a mic, so I don't need this mic. Okay, so they're gonna need they gonna need some faith in you. Alright? You you guys are gonna be the ones that's gonna give them some faith. Alright, so I need you guys to tell me some things that you remember that a boxer athlete would need in order to compete. Don't you even know how to run? Yes, you need to run. Strip. You need a ball sled, my man. A helmet, yes, you got a helmet. My actual Olympic helmet. Yes, that's what I was waiting for. We need to get shoes. That's the shoes. So these are actually my sprint spikes. My actual Olympic spikes. And they look like a sprint spike, except they've got a brush on the bottom, which has needles on the bottom of them. So what I'm going to have y'all do is y'all are going to guess. I'm going to take one guy and one girl who's gonna get a t-shirt that if you guess the number of spikes at the bottom of the shoe. Mind you, this is what keeps you gripped on the ice. So I'm gonna walk past. Who y'all got faith in? Who got faith in? Wait, what's I say here? What's the number? 
，就是，就是，就是，就是。Alright, the answer was two twenty. So my guy and my girl that got the closest is right here. Thank you guys. Y'all give it up. Give it up. Give it up. Give it up. So I really wanted to give the opportunity for people to. Oh, I got a mic and a mic. Okay, so obviously I'm gonna fuck right. So I really wanted to give the opportunity for people to uh, come up and ask questions or uh, take pictures and have, you know, let's, let's uh, have a good one. You know, want a shirt, don't know how to act with it. All right, so um, I guess we can actually take a couple more questions before y'all have to head out of here. Um, yes. So that we don't run out of time. Undergrad. So I was able to kind of mature a little bit to know how to handle it. But in the time when I didn't, when I was a collegiate athlete and still getting a lot of press for, especially my senior year when I started breaking world times, I really just started to humble myself. And it goes back to that whole thing and knowing where I was trying to go and not necessarily just living in the moment. And so you can get all this press, you can get all these people paying you attention, but at the end of the day, you gotta remember where you're trying to go. And so even though we're being celebrated in this moment of qualifying or whatever, those moments of qualifying weren't the Olympic Games. Right? And so I could be happy and be grateful, but very humble and understand that I'm still trying to go somewhere else. Uh, I have a question. Yes, sir. Right. Okay, so I know you play for Nigeria and all that, yes. but why didn't you play for America? That's a great, great question. So when I first came out of college, that's an amazing question actually, because I get this. When I first came out of college, I was ranked number one in NCAA and number six in the U.S. in the 100 hurdles. And so I had an opportunity to try out for the U.S. team that was very realistic. But one thing I started to think to myself was I understood my purpose. Remember I told y'all to remember that word. And my purpose, I felt like, was to contribute to the betterment of everything that I represent. And so I felt like I had been able to do um, Chicago proud. I had done HF proud. I had done ETHS proud. But I, what, I, what I had really done for Nigeria, and these are still the same people that I represent with my culture, with my name, with the food that I eat. And so I really wanted to give something back to Nigeria. And I didn't, I didn't like that there were so many things that were negative as opposed to all the positive things that were happening for the country. So when I first started coming out for track and field, I said, you know what, if I ever became a professional athlete, I would do it for Nigeria because I know that I would do Nigeria proud. And that's why I did track for Nigeria and then eventually. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. How do I like stopping? Oh yes, that's a great question. So the person that sits in the back is called the brakeman because they actually pull the brakes. That's why they, they actually call them the brakeman. So when we cross the finish line, I usually start to yell a little bit like, ooh, and I'll tap my brakeman on the head and then they'll know it's time to hit the brakes. <laughs> on your journey, who were your mentors, your coaches, mental? You know what, I had a lot of people to lean on, particularly my family and my close friends. Um, I really kept a lot of positive people in my circle from from school. I mean, I could I could name drop, but I mean, I, most of the people are, are here, so I don't know if that would make a difference. But it was like my coaches, um, it was my my parents, for sure, my siblings were a huge part of keeping me motivated and keeping me going. And I think it's a unique way because I came out with kind of a crazy idea. And so instead of them saying that the idea was crazy, they were just encouraging me to live in that purpose. And so I think that was a lot of the mentoring uh, that I really received mostly was through people that were just reassuring me that I wasn't doing something that was outside of my, my reality. And so Thank that was it. Thank you. Hello, I'm back here. 
Dr. Adigan, I just want to say that you are an absolutely amazing, awe-inspiring individual, and I thank you for sharing the story. Right here. Oh. Uh, so like, the whole story, I heard it, but like, did y'all get bronze or gold? What y'all, like, how y'all do? We finished 20th out of 20. That's thorough. <laughs> but like I always tell people, and honestly, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you said that, right? Because a lot of times we quantify doing well by making a first, second, or third, or getting gold, bronze, or silver. But really, at the end of the day, the biggest victories come in your legacy. They come in your ability to do things that people can actually see later. There's a lot of first places that people don't remember. Most people never remember second place, and they definitely don't remember third place in a lot of cases. And not because they're not important, but because what is it that those accolades actually did to leave a legacy? So even though we didn't finish first or second, we were the first to ever do it. Um, excuse me. Sorry. Hello. Hi. Um. So, how did you maintain a social life, and friends, and stuff like that? Cause you so like, and like, okay. Hey. to be able to not only dedicate the things that are important academically or athletically or whatever, you have to maintain your social life because in the end of the day, you have to have a place to release. So that has to be a part of sleep, food, this all has to be a part of your time management. You have to set aside time to release. And one thing I did, which I share with a lot of incoming freshmen that come to University of Houston, is every single Friday, I would, all, I would take off from school. Like, I mean, every Friday night after school, I wouldn't do no homework or anything. That was the one evening that I would spend, whether it was just soaking in a bubble bath, whether it was watching a movie, anything. That was my time to decompress from the week and actually come back. But then Saturday, Sunday, and every other day of the week, I'm going hard. One more? Okay. Um. You mentioned, you know, like you were in America. So my question was, do you have to be born or like be from a certain country to be an Olympian for that country? Great, great question. So the reason why I have dual citizenship for Nigeria is because actually per the constitution in Nigeria, if you have a parent or grandparent that's born before 1960, you are automatically a Nigerian first. And so I was already born a Nigerian citizen, although I was born in the United States. And so they allow you to also keep your dual citizenship. So I was already a Nigerian and an American. But not all countries work that way. Countries are very different, so you have to kind of check with each country. So we know that in just a few minutes here, the bell's gonna ring. Um, can we again? And I just want to thank you for also being a, a great audience today, asking good questions. Thank you for being a great audience and participating. I want you to stay seated until the bell rings, not running around.